Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Tim Davidson. I'm here to present our work on hyperspherical variation autoencoders, uh, which is joint work with the aforementioned names, of which most of them are actually present in that row. Um, so if you have any additional questions after the talk, please feel free to bother them. Uh, they would love to talk to you. Um, so I want to start this talk by stating the manifold hypothesis, which most of you might be aware with, which roughly speaking means that our observed high dimensional data uh, actually is generate by, generated by a lower dimensional manifold. And much of deep learning is actually concerned with trying to find and recover this manifold. So if you look at the graphical model that looks something like this, where you have x indicating our set of observed variables in high dimensional space, and z our set of stochastic latent variables responsible for generating x. Um, the generative model is then the joint distribution of x and z, which can be factorized as following, where the goal is to maximize the likelihood of our data using such a, gener uh, such a generative model. The problem arises when this model is parameterized with neural networks, because this problem typically becomes intractable. So one way of going around solving this is using variational inference. Um, a lot of been, has been said in the previous two talks about this, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Uh, we can rewrite this objective to get a evidence lower bound, where following variational inference, we pick a variational family Q to restrict our search space of latent manifold distributions, and we try to find a Q star that best matches our posterior for each data point. The two problems that we then have to solve is, how do we actually go about finding this Q star? Um, and two, how do we compute this scale divergence that just popped up? Uh, this is where the V comes into play. Uh, so V, as mentioned before, is a principled way of performing variational inference um, in an autoencoding setting. So the big discovery or the big contribution in V is the inference network, where instead of optimizing a Q star for each and every data point, we get this amortized, uh, amortized inference idea where we have a shared neural network uh, that outputs the parameters of our posterior distribution. Um, however, we're not there yet because we still don't really know how to optimize this thing. For this, we use something called the reparameterization trick, which was first proposed by King Man Welling in 2013. Uh, the idea goes as follows. We sample some noise from a distribution that is not directly dependent on the parameters of the posterior distribution and we use some differential uh, transformation to make the sample directly depend on the uh, posterior parameters. This way we can back propagate through the inference network and directly optimize to find the best Q star for each data point. So if you put that together uh, in a Gaussian assumption, it looks something like this, where you have your um, X high dimensional input, uh, input da uh, data point going through your inference network, which outputs your parameters, um, which creates a sample, and then reconstructs. Um, most work in the literature uses a Gaussian prior and posterior for this. Uh, there are a couple reasons for this. One is that it has some very nice mathematical properties. Two, the reparameterization trick that was crucially important, as I mentioned before, is rather trivial for a Gaussian. Uh, we simply multiply the noise with our variance parameter and we add it to the mean. Um, and additionally, the Kell divergence is very nicely computable in an analytical fashion. However, upon closer inspection, there are some issues with a Gaussian. Uh, particularly in low dimensions, we have something called origin gravity, where because most of the probability density is concentrated around the origin, points are actually encouraged to cluster in the center. This is not necessarily an issue, but if you have a latent distribution that, for example, has multiple clusters, you get the behavior that all these points are clustered towards the center, which is not necessarily what we want. We want them to actually be separated as far from each other as possible. Uh, additionally, you can have a distribution where there's no mass in the center at all, like for example, a hypersphere, such that if you try to optimize for the center, you get in some tricky behavior. Um, so what would we ideally want in this prior? We'd want a uniform prior that doesn't have any sort of mean bias and freely lets points float and only optimize for the variance. Additionally, also in higher dimensions, you get some unexpected behavior with Gaussians. Um, so in higher dimension, a Gaussian starts to behave kind of like a soap bell, where 
most often probability mass increasingly starts to be concentrated on a thin shell of a hypersphere where it's not completely obvious what happens in that point when you try to draw samples or try to interpolate. Specifically, if you take two points on this shell and you try to interpolate through some sort of straight line, you're almost guaranteed to go into very low probability density areas where you get pretty poor samples. Um, so one of our ideas was, well, it seems obvious that you want to try and see how that is solved if you use a distribution that is actually naturally defined on a hypersphere. Uh, lastly, I want to say a little bit about manifold mismatching. Um, so this is not unique for a Gaussian, uh, but I think the most um, relevant for our paper. Um, so if we consider our observed data X to lie on some lower dimensional manifold M, for most real world data, this manifold M is going to be non-trivial. So think, for example, about pictures of, uh, of, of, of digits. The moment you start rotating them, you no longer have your nice Rn, you have a combination of maybe Sn and Rn. Or when you have a three-dimensional object, which you start to rotate, you have an SO3 uh, generative factor in there. This is problematic when you make the assumption that your latent distribution is a Gaussian, because there doesn't exist a continuous and invertible global mapping between your Z at this point and your true latent manifold M, um, where you get something back when your dimensionality of Z is sufficiently larger than your dimensionality of M, because you can at this point often smoothly embed M in Z. Um, but you still get issues when, for example, you go to sampling, because you're no longer guaranteed to sample from M. You're probably going to sample from some nonsense space, and especially when you start to interpolate through two points uh, in M. You're going to leave your manifold and get more nonsense samples. Um, so to make that a little more tangible, we did an experiment where we generate some samples from some mixture distribution in the hypersphere. And we subsequently transform these samples to a higher dimensional space through some noisy nonlinear uh, transformation. The task then is to recover the topology of this latent generative um, distribution. Um, so this doesn't really work for Gaussians as expected. So from left to right, you first have a simple autoencoder where there's no distributional hypotheses at all. And you see that it pretty nicely recovers some sort of circle structure. Um, but you lose all your probabilistic interpretation. Next is a Gaussian VE where you see that points are going to be squashed towards the center. So even though it's still very separable and it looks really nice, your topology is mostly lost. As we start to scale down the influence of the Kell divergence, which is used to regularize and enforce its distributional hypotheses, um, we start to recover more and more this hypersphere, or the circle in this case. But the problems are still there. Mainly, there's this huge hole in the middle. So if we start sampling, we're most likely to sample from the hole, which is not really what we're looking for. Additionally, if you try to interpolate through a point in the orange and the green part, you're going to go through this hole again, and you're going to have more nonsense samples. Um, lastly, we have our work, uh, which uses a hyperspherical latent space, which almost perfectly recaptures uh, the problem, as is expected. Um, so the question then becomes, well, beyond this toy example, are there more reasons to actually explore if it's useful to have a hyperspherical latent space? Uh, so one thing that's nice is that it now opens up the possibility for a uniform prior. Because a hypersphere is compact, we can actually have a uniform prior on that. Um, you also, beyond typical directional data, like for example, wind direction, you have a lot of modern data sets like images um, and texts, which are often go through a pre-processing step, which effectively makes them lie on the surface of a hypersphere to focus on their directional distributional properties. Um, there are some cons, uh, mainly that, for example, the, um, the surface of a hypersphere collapses. As you go to higher dimensions, it actually collapses to zero, which is not the most stable place to be. Um, so one candidate for hyperspherical distribution is a Fomesis fissure. So a Fomesis fissure is often called the Gaussian of a hypersphere, where you have two parameters. You have the um, kappa, which is the concentration, similar to the variance you have a mean direction, which is no longer, for example, the origin, but it's a direction on this sphere. Um, 
another con here comes into play that has to be noted that for Famesis Fisher, this concentration parameter is a scalar. So it's not unique for every dimension, but it's the same for all dimensions. So how do we go about actually making this work for a VE? As mentioned before, we need two things. Uh, we need to be able to reparameterize the distribution, and we need, to be, uh, we need a way to quickly compute this, uh, this scale divergence. So the first part is a little trickier for a VMF due to the sampling procedure. So you need rejection sampling to sample from a VMF, which doesn't allow for a very trivial reparameterization trick. So fortunately, there was wonderful work by uh, Nyset et al. last year that outlined a procedure to still do this. Uh, however, in the original paper, they only outline how this works for a single transformation of the proposal distribution. Uh, we basically show that you can extend this to n additional transformations and their lemma still hold, which is cool. Um, the other part is the Cal divergence, which even though the good news is it's analytically nicely defined, the bad news is you have a bunch of Bessel functions and fractions, which are really nasty things uh, to work with. Um, honestly, I would say 20% of this work was on the derivations, 80% on making Bessel functions and fractions work in a computational graph. Um, one nice thing though with the rejection sampling specifically for a VMF is that it is not suffering from the curse of dimensionality at all. Um, more of that is in the paper, uh, interesting stuff. So the next step is, well, we knew that this worked for stuff where we know that it's um, generated by a hypersphere. What about, what about data where it's not that obvious? Uh, does this uniform prior, for example, actually add to just arbitrary data? So when we train unsupervised MNIST, um, we get the following. We see that for a Gaussian on the left, most latent data points are still gonna be concentrated around the origin outwards. So it's still a little clustered to each other. Whereas when we use a hypersphere, this is a projection of S2, uh, we see that there's much more room to freely float in the space and for clusters to separate from each other. And we can quantitatively verify that by training a classifier on these representations where we actually see that a hyperspherical latent space outperforms a Gaussian one um, up to around dimension 20, after which we get problems with the surface collapse and we get problems with um, this, this single uh, variational parameter. Um, the last experiment that we did is on graphs where um, we looked at a work that was published now almost two, three years ago by Thomas Skiff on variation out encoders using graphs, where this follows most of the setup that we described before, with the main difference being that the input is now a graph representation. Um, so the way that works is all nodes in the graph are being encoded and they're being reconstructed through a dot product where uh, nodes that are close together uh, are assumed to have a connection, a link. If you use a Gaussian for this, you get some issues because when you use a dot product, uh, you try to look at the angle. So if your data points are all concentrated around zero, you quickly uh, change from basically angle, and you have some unstable behavior. Where you see that in this latent space, you basically get this hole in the middle because points don't want to be in the center, whereas the Gaussian is trying to push them to the center. So it's a little unstable. Um, on the contrary, contrary, if you use a hypersphere, you naturally have your points on, um, on the surface of a hypersphere, so it optimizes for this directional uh, angular relationship. Um, we're actually, again, we can quantify this where in two of the three data sets that we looked at, um, we outperform a Gaussian VE, whereas on the last one, we don't. Um, the last one is notably much larger, where we think again that here, um, we start to suffer from the fact that we can go to too high of a dimensional space in our setup, uh, and the fact that we only have the single variational parameter so that we can really optimize um, this concentration in each dimension separately. Uh, so in conclusion, um, do look at hyperspheres. They're really useful for uh, data where we know it is generated by a hyperspherical latent distribution. Uh, but also for data where that's not that obvious, uh, it could give some nice uh, separability um, properties, which can be used for downstream tasks such as classification. Um, and finally, for the odd one out case of small graphs, you could also give it a try. Future work, 
we want to look at normalizing flows. We want to try and combine the nice properties of Gaussians uh, and hyperspheres and hierarchical models, and also try to push away a little bit the surface collapse by learning, for example, the radius in a Bayesian setting as well. Um, with that, I conclude the talk. I want to thank again my co-authors uh, for the amazing support of being on the front row. Uh, and thanks everyone here. <laughs>